after about 40 years of practice, which is what it's been now, and particularly thinking about the changes that have occurred in the last couple of years since COVID, I wanted to share some reflections and some questions about what we're doing and whether traditional therapy is the best thing that we could be doing to use our time to meet the needs of gender, sex and relationship diversity clients and communities. Um, now, some of the points I might be making, you might begin to feel a little bit defensive or attacked. Uh, before shouting at me about it, maybe just reflect on what's that saying to you? Is there anything in there? Am I pressing a button? Um, and then attack me after, it's fine. But, but I, you know, I don't know if some of this is going to hit home in a, in, a, in a bad way or whether you're going to be agreeing with me. But I wanted to kind of take the opportunity to share some thoughts. Um, and I'd like to start with an observation, really, I think. Um, I think our queer clients and queers in general often have higher aspirations than their peers, than their family members. Um, many know that they need to escape from their families of origin or their hometown because they just can't sit in the heteronormative stew. So they will move towns, they will move jobs, they will go to universities, they may not return. They will push themselves out of perhaps the familial and cultural expectations that may be upon them. But this can, can also can compound alienation and isolation and often leads to poorer mental health and to substance misuse. Those that remain close to their families may be able to do so, I think, perhaps because they came out earlier and they got very positive and affirming familial support and inclusivity. But I think for many of us, we flee the nest quite quickly. Um, now, the problem with that alienation and isolation is that they arrive in cities like London without a support network, maybe needing to find people. And certainly a, a significant proportion of the last 15 years of my practice was around substance misuse, in particular chemsex. And one of the most common things that the, the guys that were doing chemsex were telling me was how they felt lonely and isolated and how when they got high and went to the, the chill outs, they felt really connected and that was their, that was their way of feeling, uh, not feeling alone and feeling connected and having great sex because the drugs helped them have amazing sex. Now I had problems with all of that, but this was the motivator, this kind of isolation. So that's just a kind of aside really. Is traditional therapy fit for purpose? And by traditional therapy, I'm meaning the very austere style and in very tasteful and but bland rooms, quite neutral, weekly appointments, 50 minute hours, where the therapist is encouraged to be neutral, uh, ther where, where therapists are taught that they should be apolitical and exist really only in the therapy room, that they shouldn't reveal anything about their lives outside of that. Now, is that fit for purpose? Is that helpful for our communities? I'm going to hold it as a question and, and say a little bit more. So why did we become therapists? And it occurs to me that there are four main reasons for a bit. Firstly, because often we've had a good experience of therapy ourselves and we want to offer that to others brackets, the wounded healer. We're working out our own issues through connection with others. And this can be problematic and need good supervision. And I think it, there's a tendency for those of us that are queer, working with our queer community, uh, to over-identify as one of the problems and to form sometimes collusive alliances. And they're quite common clinical challenges and need really good supervision. Um, but I know that my own motivation at 20 was that wounded healer trying to work out my own sexuality conflicts. And I also know from my lifetime of doing this that I'm not alone in that. Another group would be those who were born in their regular corporate world 
and they had really smart jobs and they paid a lot of money. And those people, when they enter the profession, they bring considerable confidence um, and business acumen in making their six very successful private practices. They're often setting up in smart consulting rooms that charge £25 an hour to rent, charging four or five times that, and less likely to be offering pro bono work or low cost work or working in, in, gra in a grassroots way. And they have come from master's courses, often with minimal experience of LGBT clients required and very little formal training. But they are, they're, they're there in, in the Harley Streets and Fitzrovia and, and the like. Then there are people who I think transition from charity and third sector to private practice. So people who come from grassroots activism, most likely to have undertaken an L4 or L5 diploma, gained much clinical experience in an LGBT charity where they may or may not have had much formal GSRD training, depends on the charitable group. And the fourth group I would think, I'm thinking of are those who are exiting or entering the NHS and clinical and counselling psychologists on their way out of the NHS perhaps or building a private practice to run alongside it and counsellors on their way into the NHS fostered in through IAPT programmes and propping up a service that is collapsing. So that's, they're kind of the four groups that I'm, I'm noticing who are kind of making up the therapy, the therapy field. Most of us if not, have spent tens of thousands of pounds on course fees and therapy bills and thousands of hours of studying to be a therapist. Often we've entered the profession as a second or third career and have paid these extraordinary amounts of money from loans, from savings, from inheritance bequests. Many of you, particularly arriving late as a second or third career, may never get a return on your investment and start covering the costs of your training and be earning a, 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 a viable wage. And not many people get, the, get their heads up on that in advance. When people tell me they're thinking of training to be a therapist and where should they go and study up, my speech starts with, you know you're not going to make much money at this and this is going to cost you 60, 70, 80, 90,000 pounds. So most of us are motivated by something other than money. However fun we funded it, we're heavily invested in what we're doing. So what do we like about private practice? And I'm going to talk particularly about private practice because it, to be in the directory and to be connected to peak therapy, you're mostly in private practice. You may have another job as well, but what do we like about that? What are the pros and cons? And I'd invite you to think about these questions afterwards. There's not going to be time now, but what's your focus? What's your why? Why do you do this work? Whose needs are being met? Whose needs are being met on a 50 minute, once a week hour, for example? Is it the client's needs or is it that it's comfortable and convenient for us? That people come to us, we give them this little bit of time. Um, so think about what are the motivations? Are we confident that we are doing our best work? When we really think about the work we're doing, are we informed enough? Are we effective? How do we know? Is sitting in that comfortable online room at home or, or in a therapy space with one, once, one with a person once a week the most effective way of helping our clients change and lead happier and fulfilling lives? Is face-to-face -face talk therapy, one-to-one, -one, the most appropriate for our neurodivergent clients? I mean, there's many people here who have expertise, much more expertise in this than I have. Um, are our ADHD clients comfortable with sitting still for an hour? Are our autistic clients happy sitting, being gazed at by a nice, reassuring, smiley therapist? What adjustments do we need to consider 
in order to make our practices flexible enough for the significant numbers of neurodivergent clients coming into our rooms? Um, or is that too complicated? Should one size just fit all? Um, there's a great book that uh, the Autistic Society has produced that I don't know if you've got, but you can freely download from their website that has some really good advice in, in it. And I was talking to some colleagues the other day, and in fact last night, again, Leah and I were having a conversation over dinner, um, about autism and about the, how the times are changing. When I began my career 40 years ago, I wouldn't have been eligible to train in, in psychodynamic or psychoanalytic psychotherapy. They, they would have been barred it to me as I was an out homosexual and I wasn't in a committed relationship. I wasn't the nice gay um, that they might have taken in if I was committed in a very long-term, stable, monogamous relationship. I might have got in, but most gays, and I've certainly had friends and colleagues from that period who were declined entry into the field. So I trained humanistically because that wasn't there. But homosexuality was seen as a mental illness and you were neurotic and untreatable, you were uncurable, but they could work with you to make you more comfortable, but you weren't going to get in the profession. 10 years ago, if you had an autistic diagnosis, you might not have got into a counseling course either. You've got a mental health problem. It says so here in the books. It says that you can't empathize with people. You can't do social relations. You can't read people's facial cues. We can't take you in. It's changed massively in the last decade, just in the last decade, where now, thankfully, there are many neurodivergent client therapists who have gone through training and have shown that to be a whole lot of mental health barbarism. And they're now working in, in the practices, particularly specializing with other neurodivergent clients because they get each other. And the percentage of queer neurodivergent people is really significant, um, really significant. I, I, I don't know if we've actually got data on that yet, but it's because I, I think data often follows exper lived experience and what we're seeing in our consulting rooms but I'm thinking 40%, maybe more. You'd say more. Yeah, and, and it's, it's, some of us will see more of it than other people, and lots of people are now self-diagnosing rather than getting formal diagnosis. I mean, I've self-diagnosed as ADHD, and I'm pretty comfortable with that. I don't know that formal diagnosis is gonna help me, but I don't think I could have built pink therapy if I hadn't been ADHD. So it's like, are we, we need to make sure we are, what we do is flexible enough to work with the people who come to see us. And some will be very happy with the 50 minute hour once a week in a very particular spot and not be interested in the rest of anything else. But I don't think that works for the majority. Are we also reinforcing ideas of brokenness and pathology by offering one-to-one -one therapy? Um, just re reinforcing that idea that there is something wrong with you, you need to go to therapy because you're queer and you have higher mental health problems and minority stress, etc. You're going to be hearing in a few minutes from Voda who are going to present some really strong statistics about mental health distress um, and the work that they're doing that I think challenges this idea of brokenness and puts it back into normalcy. As for therapeutic neutrality, I think it's a complete myth. The therapist is revealing themselves at every turn concerning their gender, their ethnicity, their cl age, class, dress. Should we be attached to the outcome of the client's decision? If the client, if autonomy is an essential ethical principle, but if the client chooses conversion therapy practices, how do I, within an affirmative stance, support that? I think we need to be mindful, because I think there are our, our colleagues wanting us to be neutral. I think we need to be mindful of the other ethical principles around non-maleficence and beneficence, um, and first do no harm. 
So how helpful is it to maintain a neutral stance with GSRD clients? Those who are advocating for affirmative therapies, against the affirmative therapies, are force, um, say that we're forcing people to be trans in particular. We're transing people by wanting to support their path and their direction. Um, I see my role as helping my client be all that they can be. Um, and to follow their agenda and to support and overcome any internal or external conflicts to their authenticity. But I really don't think it's possible to be neutral and affirmative. Neutrality, as Paolo Frier says, is, stands on the side of the oppressor. Um, and so I think that leads us to the importance of considering being out to our clients. And I don't think there are many examples where I think that is, people get a, a get out of jail card for that. I think it's two in particular. One, if you are working in a country where homosexuality is illegal and your life is at risk from coming out to your clients, absolutely, selectively choose if and when you tell them who you are. And I think if you are in the process of coming to terms with your own sexuality changes or gender changes and you're not yet ready to be open about disclosing that journey yourself because you're caught up in the maelstrom of all of that and you're processing that, then maybe then you get out, you don't need to disclose. But I think for the rest of us, whatever our sexuality or gender identity, we ought to be open about it. We ought to be willing to name the difference in the room if there is a difference. And we ought to be working with that and how that is because we're using our our whole self. How many of us hear accounts of therapist microaggressions? And this is one of the ways, you, or therapists who lack cultural competence or cultural humility. Is one-to-one -one therapy with therapists who barely have had any specific training in GSRD and who are supervised by supervisors who have probably had even less training? Are they the most effective resource for doing this work? There are many reasons why I think one-to-one -one therapy is potentially ineffective or dangerous or harmful for our, queer for our queer clients. And I think getting us out of the room, is a, which is a very protected space for us, is actually something that we need to be considering. The other thing is that since COVID, Almost everybody's practice is at full capacity and people have enormous waiting lists or they're not, they're not able to take any more people on and we can't satisfy the demand. So um, that could mean therapy works and is highly attractive and yes, it's a really good thing, everybody's good. But I'm not entirely convinced by that argument. I think it's more accurate to say we're in a significant mental health crisis which has been exacerbated by COVID on top of our minority stress and all the other things, and we lack adequate resources to respond to meet that demand. And I'd encourage us to think smarter about how we can use our knowledge and our passion and our skills more broadly. And that's really what today is going to be about, looking up how we can adapt and use our experience to help a wider community than just the one person who's sitting in front of us for that hour. We know that one of the most significant factors for mental health problems, against me mental health problems, and in coping with minority stress, is finding community. That's the most important thing we could do with our clients coming in and saying, do you know other people like you? Let us help you find other people. Um, because peer support is incredibly important. And this is why group work and building social events can be absolutely crucial to the client's sense of self and in finding ways to cope with minority stress. And in the 70s and 80s, before colleges and universities discovered the cash cow of running counselling and psychotherapy training programmes, and the government sought to individualise suffering and weakness, the queer communities relied on consciousness raising groups and peer-driven active listening and co-counselling in pairs. When Leah and I and Tim 
were, were starting our careers, that's what, we were, that's what we had as available as resources. PACE was set up out of, which was the London Mental Health uh, Charity, was set up out of co-counselling as a model. Um, it's a really, these are really valuable things to try to look at and, and, and investigate. And I know that many of you are already operating flexibly with reduced fee places for people on low incomes or flexibly scheduling client appointments, maybe fortnightly spreading the cost, or perhaps changing the length of sessions from the traditional 50 minute hour. But I encourage those of you that aren't to be really thinking about, am I being flexible enough to work with this diverse population and the different demands that might be upon us now with these specialist populations that were different to the mainstream heteronormative populations facing people like Freud and Balby. I mean, walk and talk therapy is something that started up and many of you may be doing it. I know Kaz has been doing this and running courses on how to do this. Um, it gets outside the confines of the consulting room. It's another way in which people can, can open up. But we're going to be exploring a whole range of things today. And I just want to say I'm really grateful to Ellis Johnson, who's a black trans counsellor, who pointed me towards several community-based projects that are predominantly focused on working on strengthening resilience and agency within the QTIPOC communities and bringing about subtitle transformation there. Collective liberation and healing from trauma. And it's interesting that those QTIPOC communities and disability communities are the people who are the most marginalised and have the least and are fighting in these more creative ways to provide services and, and support. And I, so I just think it's like, let's look outside of our whiteness at what other groups who are more marginalised and have less power are doing um, because we can learn a lot from, from that. Um, that's me. Uh, my, I've now got a specialist GSRD supervision practice and the details of that are up there. Thank you for your attention. We have about five, have we five minutes? Yeah, we, have, we can steal five minutes if there are questions or comments. Uh, Marco is going to have a microphone, um, and Richard's got, Richard is at the back, maybe we can give him one. But are there any comments or questions? Is there anything that's touched off? Yes, Maz, I see him. Hang on, wait for the microphone, please, because otherwise no one will hear you. Hello. I just wondered if you could say a bit more about the community resilience building. What forms you might see that taking? Um, I will send... Uh, I can send you the link for the Healing Justice website. Um, I'll put that into the conference notes afterwards um, because I think there's a whole range of different resources on that website. It's, it's healingjusticeldn.org, but I'll send it to you. Thank you. Tim, up here. Thank you. I just wanted to say something about evidence, evidence based, um, which is a, a, a word that's used, a phrase that's used a lot about therapy. If, if psychotherapy or counselling was really evidence based, we would be reading the evidence, for example, that from randomised controlled trials, that a combination of individual and group psychotherapy is better for most people than either one or the other. And that evidence has been around for decades. but. We, have, we live in a country where the psychotherapy profession is organised only around individual work. So, yeah, good point. Thank you. And in order to get the research, it follows 10 years or 20 years behind what practice is being done within the community and what the community is seeing. So whilst research is really important, it's actually we are seeing things in the field way ahead of researchers spotting trends. Yeah. 